we'll get more about this. But thank you very much for this uh, really illuminating uh, overview. So we'll okay. see you next week. And stay safe. Best of luck. <laughs> Goodbye. See you next. Bye-bye. See you soon. All right. Uh, Thierry Maison. Oui? And as I said, you can look at this. Uh, the article that I was reading from about breed love is from the Washington Post on the 29th of September. Uh, this kind of a shock, right? I did a compilation of this, uh, you know, the Spanish world domination went from 1494 or thereabouts until, um, what, 1660 or thereabouts, 1650, 1660. Then it was the French that ended by about 1712. Then the British uh, were living through it. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Well, Mr. Topley here in Washington, D.C. Now we have another excellent international guest, and that is our friend Stanislav Bishok. Stanislav Bishok, one of the world's greatest experts on what goes on in Kiev. I guess his book, uh, Nazis on the Maidan, has uh, essentially told the story of the uh, attempted color revolution, destabilization of Ukraine back at the uh, beginning of 2014. And he is also associated with the election monitoring organization of the Commonwealth of Independent States. And uh, we'd like to get an insight into Kiev and, and what's going on there, but also Donbass. We want to keep up with our friends there. And then perhaps the Russian view on Syria, if we can squeeze it in. Stanislav, welcome. Please take over. You have the floor. Oh, thank you very much for having me uh, once again. It's a pleasure and uh, it's an honor. And, uh, well, uh, let's begin with Donbass then. Great. Uh, well, uh, just recently I have spoken to uh, some representatives of the Donbass People's Republic. Uh, I spoke to Konstantin Dolgov, who is an official uh, representative of the foreign ministry of uh, Donbass People's Republic, and we uh, spoke about uh, the Minsk II peace agreement and with the overall situation there in the region. And he acknowledged that uh, despite the fact that uh, the situation uh, has been uh, tense, but still there were uh, no uh, uh, real hard uh, fights between the uh, uh, between the uh, Donbas uh, militia, between the Donbas army and the Kiev army. And uh, the peace agreements are uh, uh, are beginning to uh, be implemented. Uh, sure, it's it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't come easy. I mean that uh, there has been uh, a lot of criticism uh, from both Kiev and Donbas, and uh, nobody is a hundred percent content with the uh, with the uh, with the agreements themselves and with the process of their implementation. But still, as a matter of fact, and. Uh, people in Donbass and uh, the officials of Donbass, they are, are quite aware that uh, there is uh, no other option than to uh, try to uh, adhere to those agreements uh, which were uh, signed and which were uh, assured uh, by President Putin, by Councillor Merkel and by President Hollande. So it's the only document in the world uh, according to uh, which uh, uh, which is uh, devoted to this uh, situation in, Don in Donbass, on which uh, people in Donbass could uh, restore peaceful life. So it's it's the only document which exists in the world. Okay, and what can we say about uh, what's going on in Donbass? I mean, in in the uh, Donetsk People's Republic is the one that my listeners know most about. Um, how are they doing? I mean, an economic life recovering or other other things we could point to? Well, uh, actually, as a matter of fact, uh, with a little help from their friends from Russia, <laughs> sure, uh, they uh, they can uh, uh, they can count on Russia in a humanitarian way, uh, uh, primarily. And uh, there has been, I believe, there have been, I believe. 41 uh, humanitarian convoys from Russia to Donbass. So uh, people don't, uh, uh, thank God, people don't starve there. 
uh, they, uh, mm -hmm. some people, some refugees uh, begin to return to their homes, begin to uh, begin rebuilding their uh, peaceful life there, uh, trying to get some job there. And even some people from the central parts of Ukraine, for example, who are not from Donbass, but uh, uh, who don't have uh, work there in Ukraine, they uh, go to Donbass because they know if they're... Uh, uh, they can work as a uh, uh, workers as a builders, for example. So they uh, can work there in uh, in Donbas uh, People's Republics as uh, just uh, helping to uh, rebuild uh, houses and some uh, other broken uh, uh, broken apartments and so on. So uh, the life there is uh, by and large uh, becomes well. I cannot say it. Uh, it is uh, as as good and as as decent as it uh, uh, were, is as it uh, used to be two years ago and uh, earlier. But still, uh, it is not uh, the, the the region is not uh, in the state of war this time, uh, these days, and uh, people, uh, you know, can somewhat uh, a brief a brief uh, freely now. All right. Now, that is an extraordinary thing. Refugees are going to Donetsk, leaving the Kiev fascist clique area and looking for jobs as construction workers in Donetsk. And I, I guess it's the, uh, the convoys and I think the polite people who have been helping over there. I hope so. Now, let's just switch to Kiev, right? The, the big question was, Europe is saying to the U.S. and everybody else, let's normalize things with Assad. Let's stop trying to overthrow Assad. Let's lift the sanctions on Syria. Let's lift the sanctions on Russia. These are absurd. Um, so the idea was, will Poroshenko be able to stage some kind of a provocation to try to stop that peaceful process from going on? Do you have a reading on that? Well, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, if, we, uh, if we try to uh, go back uh, in time, in two years or a year and a half, we uh, could see that uh, during the process of the Maidan revolution, the interests of, uh, let's say, uh, Brussels and Washington officials uh, were uh, um, by large the same. They wanted to uh, throw uh, Ukraine away from, uh, to turn Ukraine away from Russia and to uh, you know, to build up some kind of uh, sanitary cordon uh, between okay. uh, Russia and the West. And, but uh, when the war uh, uh, broke, the interests in of uh, of Brussels and of uh, Washington uh, uh, became somewhat different because. Uh, from, the, from my perspective, uh, the Washington officials, they are quite com comfortable in having uh, some kind uh, of war, war zone in the distant uh, part of a distant uh, continent, European continent. But people in Brussels and uh, obviously the inhabitants of the European Union, they are uh, quite uncomfortable uh, to uh, to put it uh, mildly, uh, with the war which is going on on their very borders. Okay, Stanislav, I'm sorry we're out of we're out of time, but this was very interesting to hear about Donetsk. And please, we'll have you back soon in the very near future for more about this. Thank you very much, Stanislav uh, Bishok in Moscow. Thank you once again, and we'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Um, highly interesting international reports, but now let's look at some domestic. Uh, look at the uh, daily briefing of the uh, Tax Wall Street Party. We put out a live tweet of the Democratic debate. The main thing coming out of this is that Bernie Sanders is now openly declared pretty much as a stalking horse for Hillary Clinton. He is a border guard. He is a, uh, uh, a point person. He's for Hillary, a stalking horse was the term that was used in recent uh, times, right? So when the email question and the private server came up, you could see this was the big chance for the entire group of them, O'Malley and Webb and Link 
and all the rest of them, that's when they could have taken Hillary apart and done her some permanent damage. At that point, Bernie piped up to say, no, this is not a legitimate issue. I don't want to hear about these emails. Then there was the famous handshake to seal the deal. And later on, his mantra been the secretary is right. You may remember Dennis Kucinich, similar figure to Bernie, a uh, guy who uh, pro- said he was running for president. By the time we got to the Iowa caucuses, uh, Kucinich essentially dropped out. On the eve of the Iowa caucuses, he threw his support to Obama in 2008. And it's just a question of time until the party apparatus and the superdelegates in the Democratic Party push Bernie to do the same thing. In the meantime, his main activity is recruiting for Hillary. In other words, to reactivate those voters that were duped by Obama in 2008. They're now deeply disappointed. Bernie's job is to reactivate them and convoy them back into the Democratic Party so that they can work for Hillary. Uh, This essentially means that there will be no social change. If Bernie believes in any of those issues, why doesn't he simply say, I can't I don't know if I can support Mrs. Clinton because she's against me on the issues. Trump could do it. But Bernie, of course, a weak entry, uh, couldn't do it. We didn't hear anything about filibustering the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We didn't hear a militant strategy of calling a demonstration and filibustering on the inside. And, of course, nobody asked them, what about your embrace of those Saudi butchers? Uh, They're carrying out genocide in Yemen. And we've got political prisoners that we'll be highlighting in the daily briefing of the Tax Wall Street Party. We'll be giving you portraits of the people that the Saudi regime wants to kill. All right. Some other uh, issues here. Benghazi, of course, uh, is a fraud. Uh, Con- Congressman Mitchell revealed it was a fraud. Now we got Representative Hanna, Republican of New York, saying this was a pure partisan fishing expedition paid for by the American people. Obviously, they don't get to the truth because the truth is Petraeus, the head of the CIA, gave the stand down order, as is believed to uh, essentially say those paramilitaries don't intervene. The other side of it is the Huma Abedin, Wiener's, Congressman Wiener's wife, who uh, is the body woman, body person for Hillary Clinton, as it's called. Uh, she's obviously a back channel. The U.S. has been in an alliance with the Muslim Brotherhood for low these many years, maybe going back to Nasser. It's very strong these days. Huma is there as a back channel. Um, And this is pretty much the obvious story. Rand Paul in a death spiral. Rand Paul, uh, he says that the reports of his political demise are exaggerated, but I I think not by much. Uh, He did this day-long webcam expose of himself, complained about it, went to Drake University and said once again that property rights trump all of the rights, uh, and this time it was about uh, LGBT. Uh, if if you get fired, he says, if you get fired, well, then go find a job somewhere else. It's exactly the point. He does not support the public accommodations feature of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. All of that posturing, all of those visits, the Time magazine cover cannot uh, hold it up, uh, cover it up. Now, Jeb Bush has come out with his version of Obamacare. Uh, he does not ban the pre-existing condition uh, proviso that uh, essentially means that if you get sick and you don't have insurance, you never will be able to get insurance. He wants to have continuous coverage. But what if you can't afford continuous coverage, Jeb? And of course, medical savings accounts and other things, tax deductions, those work well for people with money. But the people, the 50 million at the rock bottom, uh, 40 to 50 million, they can't do that. That doesn't help them. Now, Stu Rothenberg has come up with an interesting thing. This is now in the pages of Roll Call magazine. He says, look, the Freedom Caucus of extremists, of fascists in my book, extreme Tea Party lunatics, um, they believe they're getting stronger and they will not uh, cooperate. Right. So we're heading towards a possible U.S. default starting on November 3rd. Uh, The crisis will be in high gear, at least. And then the question of shutting down the government around December 11th. Rothenberg's uh, formula is let the Republicans nominate a Cruz Jindal ticket, 
extreme right wing, proto-fascist, extreme reactionary, and then let them get defeated and maybe that